You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 296. And in this episode, I chat with Dr. Nicola Petrocchi about compassion-focused therapy, or CFT, uh, specifically for OCD. So Nicola did a study where recently um, for people with OCD, and it was a group study, um, and they were specifically looking at treatment-resistant clients, so people who have done at least six months of CBT and not seen the improvements they wanted. Um, and we discuss why he chose those people, and we talk about his therapy journey. We discuss what is compassion-focused therapy, the evolutionary view of the mind, how CFT fits in with other therapies, his study, including what is it, what he found. Then we discuss viewing OCD from a compassionate lens, the science behind compassion. We discuss different types of guilt, different exercises in CFT, working with the inner critical voice. We discuss some of the resistances to doing CFT and much more. And thanks always to NoCD for supporting the show. I deeply appreciate it. If you want to find out more about NoCD and their therapy services, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. So thank you to Nicola for his time and to you guys for listening as always. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Nicola. Welcome to the show, Nicola. Hi, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Um, and what, when I get sort of a therapist on or a researcher, I initially like to ask them um, what got them in to, to being a therapist or a psychotherapist. And it'd just be good to hear your, your journey. Oh, yes. It's, uh, I think, my personal life and, <laughs> to begin with. In a sense, I am... Um, um, you know, there, there's a good there's a good part of our dysfunctional childhood. So <laughs> the good part is that you become curious of several ways on how to help yourself, how to help maybe other people. And um, I remember when I was very young, I I actually became became very curious of um, meditation techniques and self hypnosis hypnosis techniques to kind of help myself uh, in moments where I was, you know, not so in such a good uh, place. And so after that, I, I decided that it was interesting for me to continue and explore. And I wanted it to be more consistent in my life. So I, I decided to, to study psychology and, um, and, and to understand the science behind that. And this is how I approached um, university. And then, of course, then you change your mind because the, there, there are a lot of theories. And then at the beginning, you get confused about, OK, should I become a psychoanalyst or should I become whatever other type of therapist? And then gradually, uh, you know, I realized that I wanted to go in, initially into the CBT mindset and then uh, I got was trained in CBT I became a CBT psychotherapist and then I finally found uh, compassion focused therapy nice and do you, do you still uh, use a lot of CBT based interventions and tools within your CFT work or have you kind of forgotten CBT you know, um, the, the good point of CFT, the good point of compassion focused therapy is that it was never designed to replace uh, evidence-based therapies. It's actually, it was originally uh, thought and designed to, I would say, boost and empower mm -hmm. therapies, especially when some techniques and some therapies don't take into account the motivational system, the social mentalities that could be active yeah. in the in a moment inside the client and between the client and therapy. So, in a way, the, 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 that's why I love CFT and that's why I love to teach CFT. It's 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 not some it's not another therapy approach. It's not like mm -hmm. another bunch of techniques that uh, they work better than others. No, it's not that. It's, it's more about 
helping us therapists and also us clients to understand how the, the, the type of motivation, you know, the type of intention that we use to connect with ourselves and with others, actually that type of variable, the motivation influences uh, our mood, our way of thinking. And that, so the, the, the thing that I like is that basically you can use all the CBT techniques. For example, sometimes I use cognitive restructuring, but uh, I would say I use a compassion focused cognitive restructuring. So I would say that I'm doing my best to use that technique that we know this is it's useful, but from the perspective, you know, of uh, we have a tricky brain, it's not your fault if you have this, uh, you know, um, built in biases and etc. So uh, trying to remember that even a simple cognitive restructuring could trigger a sense of shame in the client, a sense, you know, of, uh, oh, why am I so stupid? Why did I understand that before? It's, you know, so I think compassion for therapy is such a powerful approach exactly for this reason. Yeah, well said. Um, and my next question was going to be, if you could explain to the listeners, you know, what compassion focused therapy is. Um, and I, I guess for the listeners, I'll also say throughout this interview, we'll both probably say CFT, which is just compassion focused therapy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just roughly explain what it is. And then also I think what the reason I like CFT, I really like the evolutionary basis for it. Nice. it that kind of, yeah, if you could just kind of just mention that as well, it'd be good. Yes, yes. I think it's, uh, it's uh, thank you for the question. It's very intriguing because at the moment there are many models of compassion and we are um, all in, you know, attracted to mindfulness and to these several uh, quote unquote techniques, mm-hmm. you know, you know, but the problem with techniques, and this is why the evolutionary approach at the core of CFT is so important. The problem with techniques is that they can be used um, inside a specific motivational dance. Again, uh, uh, I could, for example, and this is how CFT started for, for with Paul Gilbert, uh, I could use, for example, cognitive restructuring with a client, mm. uh, but uh, I could not realize that the client is using a super self-critical attitude to, you know, convince herself or himself that, you know, that technique is useful. So uh, it's important, and this is how CFT started, to start realizing that before we uh, look at each technique and before we apply the technique and or along with applying the technique, I also can focus, I can become more aware of something that comes before. And what comes before a specific technique is the type of motivational system, the type of social mentality that is uh, active in me as a mammal and is active in you, client, as another mammal and is acting between us. Uh, And indeed, uh, what the evolutionary uh, approach of compassion-focused therapy uh, tells us is that uh, before thoughts, before having you know, the ability to speak before uh, our, you know, uh, uh, having the ability to communicate, uh, we actually as mammals, as, as, as a species that is a social species, we are built with specific motivational tendencies that in a way come first. You know, we all have the, ten- you know, all, all, also viruses, I would say, bacteria and all the mammals in particular, uh, we all want to defend ourselves. We, want, we seek safety. Uh, and these also viruses seek safety. Uh, or we seek uh, nutrients. We seek, you know, resources. Uh, social species like mammals, we, they, we also seek safeness, meaning that we have this basic um, evolutionary-based need, you know, motivation to feel a sense of connectedness and safeness. And I think that compassion-focused therapy, what is really trying to uh, tell other approaches, that no matter uh, the technique you use, you need to remember that as humans, we are modulated, we are um, shaped by 
the, you know, the, these three basic motives. And, and we need to remember that in therapy. Otherwise, a lot of techniques uh, will, will not work. And so a compassion-focused therapy uh, was developed uh, as a way to help humans, as us, mammals, to build a particular type of motivational system, a social mentality that is compassion, because we know that when we cultivate, when we train that specific motivational system, we can use our mental processes, our metacognitive processes at the best of our capacities. And so we are, for example, more able to realize that uh, no, there is not a threat in that specific element. And I, I'm, maybe I'm more able to inhibit my very automatic threat response. And so we become wiser. And, and, and at the core of compassion focused therapy is that there is the assumption that we can actually train our bodies and our brains and our minds to go and to act from the perspective of that motivational system that is compassion. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, that's why it's relevant for OCD. Um, that kind of threat system is just firing, you know, like the amygdala's going off, there's danger, there's danger, you know. And I, and that's why I like the evolutionary perspective for an OCD lens. It's like your, your, your amygdala, your brain thinks there's, you know, a tiger in the room, so to speak. It can't tell if there is one or isn't, but it's saying there is. Um, and yeah, the, the, trying to calm down or quiet in that threat system. Um, yeah, anyway, that was a ramble, but I think that's kind of why I liked your study. Um, so let me get my question out. Has it gone? So, yeah, so you're, um, you did a study, um, on yeah. group compassion focused therapy for treatment resistant OCD. Um, yeah. I want to hear about the study, but the, the first question I have is why focus on treatment resistant OCD and not people with OCD? Well, because this was um, um, a little bit of an ethical choice because, you know, we realized, um, and, and, and this is interesting because one of the authors of the, the study, one of the, uh, the, the people that helped us uh, during the study is a uh, super strong cognitive behavioral therapist in Italy. Like you, I guess the most famous cognitive behavioral therapist in Italy is uh, Francesco Mancini, is the author of many books on uh, cognitive behavioral treatments of OCD. But uh, this is how I think um, smart people work. Like they are open to new, uh, for example, to new inputs. So he became interested in compassion-focused therapy because he realized that even if cognitive behavioral therapy and with you know with all the exposures that uh, implies even if it works there are of course limitations to that type of treatment and so he heard uh, uh, I was trained in his school and then uh, I uh, started like cultivating my passion for compassion for therapy and he became interested in all our in our approach at evolutionary approach to OCD and it felt like it would be interesting to to test with OCD clients but what kind of OCD okay when you start with a pilot study in a sense you don't want to start with a treatment that we don't know if it works or not uh, and because if, if if we had started with a group of OCD clients never treated, and imagine that we, 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 found, we would find out that it didn't work out, we would have done something not very ethical because we would have postponed yeah, for them the possibility to have uh, an effective treatment. So we started very like conservative and said, okay, let's take the most difficult clients mm. uh, that there are clients that have done all the CBT treatments, that have done all, you know, at least six months of exposure, mm. Uh, and uh, let's see if what, what happens if we help them cultivate their compassionate mind. And that's why we had this first idea of starting with uh, uh, this group of clients. Yeah, yeah, good point on the ethical. Um, as, yeah, I, I almost don't want to detract from the study, but like the, the questions that are coming up for me are um, 
is there any plans to take it further as in um now that you've proven that there's been some impact on treatment resistant cases that actually let's take it to people who haven't had any treatment yet yes absolutely so this is happening actually at the moment right where we're uh, because talking because uh, in Padova you know another group research group that was a little bit inspired by this first paper they decided to test the same intervention uh, but not on eight, eight sessions they decided to do uh, a 12 session intervention which is now the I would say the minimum minimum for mm-hmm. applying compassion focused therapy um, the treatment and they decided to test um, to test intervention with people before they had the typical um, CBT treatment. And so basically, we are now trying to understand if it works or not mm-hmm. uh, with um, this kind of clients before the exposure. And I can already tell you something that is incredible because they presented this, the, the data in our in a recent conference that we just presented last okay. week. And uh, what we know is that, yes, it works. Uh, So even if uh, they did not do the exposure, like giving them the possibility to train their compassion and mind Mm -hmm. uh, already reduced in these clients' symptoms and already reduced uh, self-criticism and increased their ability to self-reassure. Yeah. Okay? And the point, however, is that the reduction in symptoms was slightly, it was less than our study where they also had the ability to, ex, to, to do the exposure. You know, they, they knew that they had to expose. What, 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 what does this mean? It means that it's, this is actually the confirmation of what uh, compassion-focused therapy is and Paul Gilbert always highlights. That is, we, compassion-focused therapy is not a replacement of evidence-based treatment. We want simply to add, to boost evidence-based treatment with the awareness of uh, what happens inside of the clients while, for example, they do the exposure. So it's crucial because sometimes we hear uh, therapists thinking that, you know, this is another school of therapy and, uh, you know, we are, all the other evidence-based therapies are kind kind of, it's not a competition, it's about how can we, you know, empower, exactly. uh, you know, and this is what we, it was nice of this recent data. Yeah, I agree. It should always be about the, the, the truth and getting the best outcome for the client, you know, Absolutely. it should never be um, dogmatic. And, um, and yeah, so what, what, what comes to my mind is I guess the next stage is maybe a study where it's merging CBT or ERP with compassion face focused therapy so i I, yeah i remember um john abramowitz and michael tuhig uh looked at merging they merged act with erp and did a trial and and something Mm -hmm. similar like that for cft would be wonderful um absolutely so for example what i envision is our next step where um for example, you do the ERP and maybe you, 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 know, you teach the client the, the, the rationale, but at the same time, you help the client to maintain a compassionate mind while they do the ERP. So for example, I ma- imagine yourself doing the ERP while your compassionate image is close to you, or maybe for, for, with the perspective of your compassionate self, or imagine training also the therapist in maintaining a compassionate dance, a compassionate relation with the client while they do the ERP. Because sometimes you hear uh, therapists doing these procedures and they can become, you know, we all kind of become a little bit like either, you know, patronizing or a little bit of like encouraging, but in a sense of like, uh, not, not in a way that I would feel encouraged by. Let, let's put it this way, so, or slightly critical. Okay, and, uh, and and I envision probably a, 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 a merging that is not just putting one therapy plus the other one, but more about okay, be aware of the type of mindset, the type of motivation that also you as a therapist have while you guide your clients in doing exposures. Okay. And the yeah. ERP. Yeah, it makes sense. It's it's almost 
the the therapist is bringing a cft like energy into the room so it's not about tools anymore it's the it's the the energy in the same way like cole rogers with um uh the core conditions you know that that was a that was an energy you bring into the room to have empathy and unconditional positive regard and all of this it's not necessarily a tool it's it's a be it's a way of being even cole rogers said that you know and almost that for cft it is like that and also that plus maybe specific techniques i and i would yeah. for example imagine um you know the compassionate image uh, close to you while you do uh, mm. the erp or uh, other type of, of techniques that we've used for example in the um, in this group during the treatment for example i would ask clients to write compassionate letters to their ocd because sometimes as clients we criticize a lot of ourselves for having the disease in the first place as if we've chosen it but we didn't the clients didn't and so it's interesting to use for example the tool of compassionate letter but a little bit transformed and instead of the compassionate letter to me uh, maybe the compassionate letter to the ocd uh, as you as i can picture it or maybe to my uh, to my ocd self you know to the part of me that is you know so worried about uh, the, the ocd worries and and what what could that part of me would like to hear from a compassionate self what kind of phrases would make the part feel more at ease and you know willing to to act yeah absolutely yeah i love that um and also often sometimes in the community and and in my own journey for many years i saw ocd as a bully and it wasn't until five years ago i started to probably less than that i started to shift that away from it being a bully to i won't say what because I think, but it's like, it was much more compassionate, I guess, is how I, I viewed it as it's, it's ultimately trying to protect me. It, it does, but it, it's doing a bad job of it. It's overprotective and it's, it's scared itself. And when you think the OCD scared, it, it stops being this monster and it starts to be this thing that almost needs you to lo- to not love it, but to, to, to care for it almost like a small child. Yeah. Now, that helped me. I'm not, I don't want to push that onto everyone, but that kind of. Absolutely. I also believe that uh, what, what we've seen in our group with eight, eight clients in this paper that we, uh, you know, we publish is that that actually was a major shift for clients. And, you know, I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to name the other types of approaches, but there are some approaches, for example, where they teach people sometimes to fight self-criticism or to fight OCD. And um, and it's it was easy, it was pretty evident that this, that there was a threat system activated by that procedure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that it was much more productive to help the clients use their compassionate mindset to look at the, the, their OCD or, you know, their, their self-criticism. And that usually it's when clients uh, told us, is when the patient t- tells you like, oh, I never thought. I never thought I could look at that part of me, you know, from this perspective. I thought I should uh, fight it or uh, there should be something that I, I needed to delete. Yeah. Get and rid of, yeah. Get rid of. And, uh, and so this is what, yeah, what's it's at the core. So as you said, you know, you, you, you kind of uh, said it like, it's, it's not really love. It's not that I end up loving my OCD mm-hmm. or... It's not that I'm going to end up loving my self-criticism. It's not about love. I mean, as Paul usually says, it's not, I mean, there's nothing wrong about love. But the point is that I can still, even if I don't love my OCD, I can still try. And this is a direction, is an intention. I'm willing. I'm really willing to see the suffering behind that. And uh, I'm willing to see the, the, the fear it stems from. And I'm, I'm, as best as I can, I'm willing to connect and, and try to heal that, that fear, trying to, uh, you know, to connect with the part, with the vulnerable part of the, the, the disease. And uh, that help, helped a little bit. Yeah, that, that's good to hear. Because, yeah, we often, 
And as I talk, I'm aware that some people may 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 ha- be happy with the idea of seeing it as a bully, and I don't want to take that away from them. They can, if that's useful for them, they they can absolutely keep it. But I think sometimes we externalize OCD, is, and I, I'm guilty as a therapist. I do this with some of my real young clients. I'll get them to s- externalize the OCD, and I think in a way that can be helpful because it it gives them something to label it as you know this is what's good it's it's the ocd it's whatever the name is they've given the ocd but um i think externalizing it too much is it stops us from remembering actually the ocd is is us it's our Mm -hmm. brain it's not separate to us it's and if if there's if there's some pain that's driving that then then giving compassion towards the ocd part of us maybe is more like to do a better job of healing it than Absolutely. rejecting Absolutely. it. And let me tell you, like, I totally agree with what you're saying also. And we have two things supporting this. We have one study um, by one colleague of us, Julia Almanova um, from Bratislava. She didn't really work with OCD specifically, but she did a distinction between self-protection and self-compassion, you know, and self-protection is what we use against the bully and self-compassion. And we know that self-compassion was better uh, in increasing uh, heart rate variability. So the ability of the vagus nerve to generate a sense of calmness and inhibition, positive inhibition of, of, of the threat response. And this is exactly also the point that we want to reach in, in, in the treatment because at the very end, it's not that we choose compassion because... Yeah, you know, compassion is cute or <laughs> because it sounds better, mm-hmm. but simply because like uh, there is a, there is a deep um, physio, there is a, there's a big physiological change that happens in a body when you choose to activate a compassion and motivation. So it, it comes with an increase in, in your vagus tone an increase in your, uh, the ability of the prefrontal uh, cortex to inhibit the threat response. And so there is an increase in oxytocin, we now know. And so physiologically, like if you go into compassion instead of, for example, into fighting, it seems like it seems like it's almost like you're choosing the right chemicals. I mean, if you wanted to go to sleep at night, you wouldn't take five coffees if the goal is to fall asleep. You would want to have the the chemicals that would help you in the process yeah, and yeah. and comp- this is exactly where compassion works because compassion motivation uh, activates a physiological response that typically is a is it slows down your heart and helps your your brain to inhibit the threat response this is exactly what we want yeah absolutely and if you can do that then you're getting yourself out of that anxious mm-hmm. fight or flight state yeah um so um i've detoured too much it'd be good to hear about your your study now and <laughs> sort of anything you want to share about it you know but i guess let me direct you a bit like um roughly what it consists of you know like eight people and and then and then i guess what you found would be good yes yes so basically as i as i told you a little bit of introduction is that <clears throat> we knew that ocd that um ERP works, but we also know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, half of the patient seems to benefit of the, of the treatment because there's a lot of refusal, dropout rates, and, and, and we know that. And, uh, and basically also what we observe is that in this particular study, um, uh, we highlighted a specific emotional feature of OCD clients that is actually has been researched here in Italy from Francesco Mancini, who's this um, professor here in Rome that studied the role of fear of guilt in OCD. So because the, the point in OCD is that uh, sometimes we tend to highlight too much the intrapersonal, purely cognitive determinants of the disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for example, the role of negative appraisal and stuff, but we, uh, we tend to overlook the importance of social and relational elements uh, to OCD. And indeed, for example, there, there's a lot of, uh, big history of looking at OCD and, for example, the obsessions and the compulsions as a way to 
try to stay away from the experience of feeling guilty. Mm. You know, we have a little bit of intolerance of the emotional state of guilt. And in particular, uh, uh, Francesco Mancini here in Italy, like, did an inter- a lot of interesting studies that basically distinguish these two types of guilt, which is <laughs> fantastic and very intriguing for compassion focused therapy, because basically said, you find out also with fMRI studies that people, we can feel guilty in a way that is a, a little bit of a pro-social flavor to it. For, so, for example, if I say something wrong uh, against you and I, and I feel guilty and I want to recuperate, I, I feel, you know, I, I didn't want to do it and, and I'll do my best and because I see you suffering and the, this actually activates a little bit of a pro-social response in me. And it's called pro-social guilt. But uh, he found out that people are also able to experience a sense of guilt that is called deontological guilt, which is a guilt that doesn't come really from uh, hurting anyone. But it really comes from, for example, um, breaking some rules. Even if nobody, you know, nobody cries, for example, um, the, there are some examples. I don't know if you have if we have time to go through them. But if you do, for example, something that is completely not relevant, so you, you go with the with the red lights in the middle of the night. You are in the desert, and uh, <laughs> the cars they don't pass there. And uh, some of us could still feel guilty for having broken that rule of no, you ha- you don't you cannot park. With- that's with the red light, okay? You need to wait, for example. And this type of guilt is the type of guilt that doesn't include necessarily someone that is, has been hurt, but includes breaking rules. And um, he found out that people with uh, OCD, they tend to be specifically sensitive to this kind of guilt. So basically, there is a kind of a specific fear of experiencing that emotion. Okay, according to this specific theory. And it's interesting because it's not the prosocial guilt that they're scared of experiencing, but more the the deontological guilt. And so we reason that, okay, maybe if we help these clients to experience compassion for themselves and to activate the soothing system, you know, this part of the the brain that actually is responsible for uh, making us feel that we are slowing down, that our you know, threat response is regulated. So if we help clients, for example, to experience compassion for, for themselves, maybe they will be also more able to accept higher levels of guilt because maybe they say something like, okay, you know what? I, I will not do my compulsions. I will try to stay away from washing my hands. Because even if I end up feeling guilty for having caused, you know, some kind of, for having broken some rules, I will be able to forgive myself because I I will be able to soothe myself. I will be able to connect with my compassion itself. So if I have this safe base, you know, if I know that I can rely on my compassion itself, at this point, I can risk more. You know, and I can afford to tolerate increased level of guilt, deontological guilt, because uh, or at least I, I will be able to, to tolerate increased level of anxiety regarding, oh, my God, maybe I will be, I will feel guilty. But who cares? You know, if I feel guilty, I eventually be able to give compassion to myself. So we basically realized, okay, if we help clients, especially in group, to to uh, access this self-soothing ability, they will also be able to stay away a little more from their compulsions. Maybe the obsession will come, maybe a little less, but also they will be able to stay uh, away from them. And this is exactly what, uh, in a way, what we found. So we took this um, these clients, they were... Uh, actually amazing clients, very courageous. We told them, no, this is the first 
uh, compassion focused therapy <laughs> group. So we are you're like pioneers. You need to help us understand if this works or doesn't work. Uh, and this is a cooperative also mindset. Like please help us. So we help you, but you need to help us. And um, and basically we started this eight week compassion focused therapy in group. And that uh, and we do we did a multiple baseline design, meaning that we assessed. It was a very small group, so we assessed. Two, we did two assessments before the groups and two other assessments at the end of the group. Uh, and unfortunately, the very final follow-up was in the middle of the first lockdown. <laughs> so it was a little like, complicated because at that stage, it was the government telling you to do compulsions, like to wash your hands. So yeah. We were like desperate because it was like, okay, how can you disentangle? But in, with much of our surprise, it worked out because um, we were able to find out that there was a reduction, significant reduction on symptoms uh, of OCD symptoms, and, and uh, but also there was a reduction in fears, fear of guilt. So compassion help them to be less scared of experiencing this negative emotion and so more courageous. And we know that compassion is, uh, is courage. And sorry, interrupt me because I tend to talk a lot. No, so that's okay. uh, tell me well, if well, I... A, a couple of things that uh, come to my mind. One is, yeah, the, it's really bad luck for your study that, that the end <laughs> of it came when that first lockdown in Italy happened, which was what, April? end of march april exactly. yes 2020 yeah. yeah which you know i i thought about this earlier because i knew this would come up on the podcast and i thought if you if you took everyone in italy or even in the uk because we then locked down pretty much straight after you guys mm -hmm. i think and you you took a baseline of everyone in italy's anxiety levels like a week before the shit hit the fan so to speak with with the pandemic yeah and then, and then two weeks into it, you you did everyone's um, anxiety. It, everyone, the average baseline is going to be way higher than so the average anxiety marker. So, like, I guess what I'm saying is, for your study, is statistically it was going to impact it, like, you, because everyone was, most people were anxious, not just people with OCD. <laughs> you know, because yeah. no one knew what was going to happen, or if it was the no end of the world. Or, yeah. Yeah. No one knew, but there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a bright side to things, right? So consider that it was funny to realize that um, towards the end of the group, there was a, a, a you know a bizarre cheerful feeling in the group mm. while COVID was approaching and the lockdown was approaching, and I think it's connected to the sense of <laughs> common humanity that basically these covenant things like triggered in us against our uh, willingness I, I would say and uh, so the, i still remember one one of the final sessions i was like this is magic because i still remember this group of cl amazing clients talking to each other at the very end and like everyone anticipating like oh have you heard next week we will have to, you know, lock down and still they're asking us to wash hands. And the funny part was that um, one of them amazingly kind of said something like, hey, guys, did you see? And everyone was like, yeah. And me and my co the other co-therapist, we were like observing this fantastic connection. And I was like, now they are all like us. And uh, now I even have one, one client said, after three hospitalizations, now, so before I was the weird person, but now people call me and ask me suggestions on how I should wash my hands properly. And I found that was such a, mm. an amazing way to uh, also to connect and to and to actually say a big truth, we are the result of the social environment. So in this specific moment, uh, all the world was exposed to this influence and made us become all a little bit like obsessive OCD, you know, 
uh, actors, you know. And so it was funny because, yes, it was negative, but at the same time, for some of them, it was slightly alleviating to consider that a lot of people at that stage were had their same fears. Yeah, really good point. Um, and that brings the question to mind. So did everyone have sort of contamination-based OCD or were there other themes of OCD? No. So basically, um, I don't remember completely, but I have, you know, I came prepared. Yeah. And so there were actually every type of uh, type of obsession, I would say. Mm. So there were doubts and accidental harm and checking. So there was mostly um, this type of uh, obsession, but also uh, thoughts about unacceptable taboos and, and mental rituals. So some, some, some clients have this specific type of fears, some contamination and washing, uh, and some other of symmetry arranging and counting. So I would say that it was pretty much... Yeah, good, good uh, array. Uh, a good, uh, yeah, uh, all types of... Um, obsessions i would say yeah and they also gone through different types of therapies mostly cbt standards okay yeah yeah um the other question i had on the study just to kind of bring it to life for people is um in in your actual paper i'm not sure if it's open access or whether you need like yes it's it's open access in frontiers of psychology you can download it and uh, yeah all right, cool. Anyone listening, I'll I'll get the link and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but yeah, in that you break down roughly what you do in each session, which is yes. really good. But yes. if there was any sort of like highlights of things you did, you wanted to share just to kind of bring to mind, because most people listening know what an e- a rough ERP session would look like, you know, what are some of the things you, you were doing from a CFT point of view? Yeah, so what, uh, thank you for the, the question, because I think it's the most important part, you know, of the job that we did. Because we, first of all, we helped uh, clients understand the unchosen nature of the brain. So literally the first part of CFT starts with reality checks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that you feel uh, that you feel weird, that also you are treatment resistant, so you must feel extra weird about, you know, not... Uh, like working well with this treatment that they say it's so it's so wonderful CBT is so wonderful so we started with it's not really your fault you haven't chosen that and uh, we started with meditations and and reflections on it's really true we don't choose that and on top of not choosing our brain you also didn't choose all the family experiences that we know for certain have generated the specific sensitivity to guilt. So, and it's, it was incredible how they would talk to each other about, oh yeah, that's true. This has also happened to you. Your family was like that. So it was a little bit of a like common humanity sense of, oh, maybe it's true. You know, maybe, maybe it's not me. It's not that I don't, it's not that I'm lazy or it's not that I, uh, you know, I'm choosing not to stop my symptoms. It's that I don't, really didn't choose my brain. And also for them, it was intriguing to look at the three circles and, and the fact that, because of course CBT doesn't cover that. And they, they looked at, okay, you have these obsessions, you need to do an ERP, they explain the rational, but basically they are, they're not helped in understanding how there's a specific system that is the soothing system that could help them in that. And again, this was not chosen. It has been chosen for us. I mean, we, we did not choose to have a un, un, undeveloped green soothing system. So we said, okay, you know, this is the reality and we need to train it. And what they liked a lot, uh, because in compassion-focused therapy, we do a lot of pair um pair exercises and it was really amazing because we asked them to visualize the circuitical part and like we do a lot in circuiticism in compassion focused therapy to look at the circuitical part and trying to see really what it does to us and then we asked them to write each of them a compassionate letter to their circuitical part kind of like okay Thank you very much. I mean, I guess you've tried somehow to, to protect me. 
it was not very effective. I have to say, actually, things turned out to be worse than before. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to connect with you from my pers- compassionate perspective. And so they wrote a letter to their critical part, and we would ask them to, in couples, to put a chair and to read the letter to the to the chair that was the critical part. And the other person, the other colleague, like looking at them, you know, witnessing the... Mm. the, And that was amazing because we were like hearing and uh, and that was amazing to to hear how naturally when when clients are helped approaching that mindset, they naturally come up with compassionate words and compassionate intentions. So... But that was very, uh, there was a super shifting moment for them. Yeah, I like that. And um, sort of breathing, breath work and like soothing rhythmic breathing and all, all of that. Was that in most sessions or was that a regular part of the practice? No, it's a part of each session. Actually, we start every session with um, the breathing, you know, the, going back to the soothing breathing rhythm and to the three intentions of compassion focus therapy you know i'm here because i'm you really committed to to alleviate my pain to help myself but also to do something that might potentially help others but and also to be open to the help that might come from others so we start with breathing soothing breathing rhythm and with the focalizing these intentions which which sets really the motivation and then we will have a topic for every session we would do exercises and um, and we would, uh, you know, help them incarnate and embody their compassionate self to walk from the room. Um, and imagining, for example, being in front of their triggers, the typical triggers that would trigger their, you know, uh, their compassions, uh, but with their compassionate self. So, for example, we ask them to experience how the compassionate self posture could help them while their obsession would pop up. And so they were they realized, for example, that if they remember to breathe, to, to connect with their soothing breathing rhythm and to change their posture and to change their facial expression, the obsession, yes, they would come, but they would have more ability to uh, you know, stop the compulsions. And, and so they will have more control over it. And, and we would say, you see, it's the soothing system helping you, sustaining you, and compassion is really helping you in this. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this question actually comes from a friend of mine called Johnny, who uh, is a therapist and he uses CFT a lot. Um, he wants to know, was there any sort of fears, blocks or resistances to doing compassion work from any of the participants? Oh, absolutely. Yes, actually, as we know, in compassion focused therapy, there is no compassion focused therapy without uh, resistances to compassion. You know, that's actually the core work of compassion focused therapy. So resistances came from the very first session to the point that you really have to commit uh, to to yourself and say, okay, resistances to compassion are not a mistake. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's it's actually at the core of the part. So most of the resistances were in, first of all, um, so what, what, one typical resistance was that they would not trust themselves. So as, as every OCD clients, uh, we of course have the tendency to say, okay, I'm experiencing this sense of alleviation of my pain, but am I really experiencing this? Yes or no? Or maybe am I faking it? You know, the typical doubts that uh, uh, we have when we are in our OCD, you know, uh, us, self. And so we had to help them experience compassion also for this doubt. So because we had to help them say, when you have these doubts about the whole process, this is not a problem. This could be welcomed in the process itself. And uh, so we had them understand that, again, this was a protective part of them. So there was not a mistake, was not a, something to, to avoid. The second type of resistance was mostly linked uh, to give compassion to themselves because they basically have this sense of... Um, being responsible for not doing enough to heal or 
um, you know, I am, you know, without hope and this specific group of clients, they were, you know, like, you know, I've done all that. And this, if this didn't work out, what else? Yeah. And so a lot of resistance would come with the voice of, you know, just give up. No, it's not helpful. It's not going to help. And and at this stage, it was like a little bit of a depressive resistance, I would say, you know. So a part that is like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm sad. I don't want to try What's this. the point? What's the point? And then again, like helping them say, can we experience compassion also for this part? Mm. And, yeah, I like that. And I'm guessing a lot of um, resistance in the form of compassions it's like airy fairy is the word that comes to mind. It, it's like woo woo. It's out there. It's, it's, how's yeah. it going to help me? You know, it's just, it's fluffy. It's like mindfulness. It's yeah. Exactly. And this, this is usually clarified at the beginning because we had to say, but remember, you know, compassion is really courage uh, at the very core, at the very core of it. So, uh, you know, if you feel that, self you know touching your own body and, and activate the soothing system or, or the, you know repeating soothing phrases is something fluffy uh, just remember the physiology behind that just remember that is your way to try to navigate this this uh, very ocean so it's it's a uh, it's a courageous thing you're doing and uh, and so we would had to go back there very often thank you for reminding me this because yes that was um, that was a problem. And sometimes they were very skeptical because like, oh, I've tried CBT, which is the best of the best of the best. Why should I try that? And what they you tend to love also in the qualitative results is the group connection. And um, But group connection that was colored with compassion because, you know, you can gather in a group and do a fantastic group complaining or uh, okay let's let's go, let's do a group self victimizing um, activity <laughs> so you can you know sometimes the group is not just the group is what kind of motivation colors the group and uh, in this in this group we were able to notice that people would really start using compassionate skills to help each other and and so we would hear from small chats before the group and so of course we need to do more qualitative studies on future uh, you know uh, experiments with bigger samples but we already could see that uh, it really can shift what they how they experience their social connections yeah thank you yeah i like that um one other thing that comes to my mind is and you mentioned it before like the the harsh inner critic that mm-hmm frankly most people on this planet have it's not just people with OCD you know but with OCD especially um whether either answer this either from the study or from just in your own work with CFT yes. with other people um how do you work with that really harsh inner critic that's really sort of criticizing and judging and putting the person down Absolutely. Uh, so thank you for this discussion because actually it makes me highlight um, uh, one important thing. So the, 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 the first thing in, in the OCD clients is that they seem to have two types of critical ruminations. And they, they, I think this is important. So the first, ta- the first thing that was addressed by, by compassion focused therapy was the type of self-criticism connected to um, like how, how could I have been so careless? Could I, uh, I, I couldn't have thought ahead about 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 in such content, for example. Okay, so this is the, usually the first way the OCD clients criticize themselves. But then there is a little bit of a secondary criticism, and also we address that with compassion for this therapy. Is the the secondary criticism regarding I'm crazy? Why am I doing all, all this compassion? I'm ruining my life. So criticism, it's when criticism becomes you know, yeah. explosive. And the, the, the work is always about helping them realize that is fear comes from fear and, yeah. and helping them realize that it doesn't come overnight, but it's literally 
trying to, to, to observe the security of her voice with a compassionate perspective. Like, so I know it's difficult. I know maybe today you will not be able to do that. But again, let's try to close your eyes. Let's try to visualize this part of yourself that's telling you this. Uh, what is really behind that? What sits behind this part? What is it really scared of? Uh, what could we, uh, could we possibly approach this part uh, with compassion? Oh, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I know. I know it's it's hard, and I think we we need to take care of also of this part that is tired of that. But if you could tell only one word to your self-critical part in front of you, one word that could basically make this part feel slightly more at peace, calm, what would it be? Or do you have a, a color? So if you can produce any word, do you have a color that could surround that self-criticism and... and make it feel more nourished or, and, and that's it's what I thought, what I realized is the repetition of this procedure. It's not like that it comes. Yeah. Once. Once. It's more about going back to the rationale, to the idea of extending compassion to, to self-criticism. And gradually what I noticed is that with people, because people have the idea that self-criticism can reduce like with like a Kung Fu move, like, okay, let's do this technique and that's it. But, you know, it's a language and there's, there, there are no easy techniques to learn English. You know, I, I learned English over the years. And it's, I mean, and I really don't believe in people telling me you don't learn English overnight. There's not such a thing. You, you need to practice and you need to forgive yourself for ups and downs. But you need to say, OK, time is crucial here. I need to do it more and more. And this is a, the mental training that is at the core also the Buddhist tradition is not like, oh, I have this inside and that's it. I'm done with self criticism. It doesn't work like that. It's a, it's a practice. Yeah, yeah, that's a good illustration. I mean, firstly, your, your English is very good. Um, oh, so thank you. you. You've clearly, <laughs> clearly worked hard on it. Um, yeah. The, but yeah, you're, you're, if you think about the, you know, having that compassionate dialogue with yourself, it's a process and it's, it's your, your, you're relearning how to speak to yourself effectively. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. This is crucial, sure, because sometimes uh, I always tell my client, like, do you, do you speak any other language except for Italian? I was like, yes, English. Okay. So did you learn with one of these magic techniques that teach you English overnight? Like, no, they don't work. Or one of the machines that you wear while, while you sleep and teach you English? No, do not work. So what did it work? Uh, practice, exposure to people talking to me in a compassionate way. And, and so it's going to work the same way. So be patient with yourself because like learning self-compassion is like learning a new language. And, uh, and this alleviates a lot of like, okay, but you've been repeating me this for many sessions. Why haven't I learned this? And I was like, because it is not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be repeated. And this is how I learned, and this is how you will learn. Yeah, very good point. It's probably why I've never learned a second language because I start <laughs> and then give up. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I think it's important. I, I, that reassured me a lot when I was, for example, learning how to sing. I was like, mm. it's okay. It's not about it. It's not, not an intellectual understanding. It's yeah. it's more of a practice. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's showing up and putting in the work um so slight change now um very different change if you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self what mm -hmm. would you what would you say to them oh such a beautiful question i would say oh i would say don't worry don't worry my dear don't worry i will be i will be here waiting for you and um um, all the suffering that you're experiencing, you will understand it. And uh, by 42, you will be more free. You will be happier. And I, and you are amazing. I love you. But so don't worry. Now it's every, everything is very confused, but everything later will become much more clear. And enjoy. I would say that. Yeah, a compassionate phone call. Um, and then you've got you've got like an advertising billboard in Rome. 
Um, what do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? Oh, um, advertising for what? <laughs> uh, anything you want. It's just a message. It's just you're communicating a message. What is that? Oh, I like these kind of things. Like um, I would, um, I would say, stop and find three things you're grateful for in this very moment. Mm. Because I, I think that gratitude is the corresponding emotion of compassion because when usually when I'm grateful about something, I'm grateful about a compassionate act of someone like, oh, I'm so glad, I'm so grateful that Stuart asked me this question because it helped me connect with my 20 years old man. And, and so compassion, and gratitude in my opinion are very much connected and uh, that's why sometimes I use gratitude as a way to remember how many people have been compassionate towards me today yeah I like that yeah I can do one um okay and then lastly is there anything else that you wish you could have said or shared today um really thank you for your thank you for your work like I I really appreciate but I, I, I feel very much sustained and comforted by webinars like these and by podcasts like this because I listen to them uh, while I wash my dishes, <laughs> while I wash my, my teeth, brush my teeth. And I think that committing, your commitment to do things like these are truly a compassionate commitment because they give, they, they bring voices to people and, they, and we humans are helped by this so thank you very much this is my yeah, thank you thank you that means a lot yeah um yeah yeah i appreciate it so um yeah thank you so much for your time you know i read your yeah. study and i really wanted to get you on and uh it's it's been wonderful to share it with everyone listening thank you for listening to this week's podcast if you enjoy the ocd stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation please go to the ocdstories.com forward slash support all tips no matter how large or small are greatly appreciated please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast and thank you to nocd for supporting our work if you want to find out more about nocd head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.